This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. Welcome to A Conversation with History. I'm Harry Chrysler of the Institute of International Studies. Our guest today is Joan Wallach Scott, who is professor in the School of Social Science at the Institute for Advanced Study. Her most recent book is The Politics of the Veil. Professor Scott, welcome to Berkeley. Thank you. Where were you born and raised? I was born in Brooklyn, raised in Brooklyn. And looking back, how do you think your parents shaped your thinking about the world? Oh, they shaped it in many, many ways. Um, my parents were both high school teachers, um, my both history, high school history teachers, although I like to think that's not the reason I became a historian. Um, but it was definitely a family in which ideas mattered and in which politics mattered. They were both on the left, in fact. My father was, a, uh, was fired um, in 1953 from his New York City school teacher position for refusing to cooperate with, uh, well, it wasn't a McCarthy committee, but it was a McCarthy-like uh, investigating committee in New York City. And, and what was the conversation like around the dinner table? A lot of organizing, th talking about organizing yeah. politics, uh, issues. Analyses of politics and issues, and also uh, discussions about history, um, how my mother continued to teach all of, all of those years. So stories about students, about how they taught um, the Civil War or various things in American history. My mother would puzzle over why kids could understand some things and not other things. So it was a... The idea of teaching and the importance of teaching was very much present at the dinner in the dinner table conversation. So it sounds like there was a lot of talk about methodology even, <laughs> even before you uh, went uh, on to university. And and any high school teachers that particularly influenced you or, or any setting before you went to college? Yeah, um, there was a particularly one high school teacher who was actually a high school teacher of English. And um, it was an advanced placement English course. And I always think that he's the one who taught me how to read. He taught me. We use those old Brooks and Warren understanding poetry and understanding literature books. Um, and he taught us how to read poems and how to read beneath the lines and literature. And um, I, th I think now, I had to write something about these early years of my formation. And I think now that. I didn't know it then, but that was when I sort of fell in love with language and ideas of literary representation. Mm -hmm. And and what was his name? Just for the record. his name was Saul Schlackman. Uh -huh. <laughs> and then where did you do your undergraduate work? At Brandeis University. And uh, what what did Brandeis uh, contribute to uh, the shaping of, of your intellectual mind? Well. The first year I was at Brandeis, there was a. The first year I was at Brandeis as a freshman, uh, Herbert Marcuse gave a lecture to the incoming freshman class that was called "The Nuisance Value of an Education," mm -hmm. and the idea was that you were supposed to do something with what you learned, um, be critical, be sort of politically engaged. Um, and I remember, well, I've never forgotten that. I've forgotten a lot else of what happened in those first mm -hmm. weeks. And then the next influence was um, a course taught by Frank Manuel, which was the Western Civ course, the, the second half of the introduction to Western civilization. And that is, I think, why I became a historian. And mm -hmm. I know from my own friends that I'm not the only one that that, that happened to, that Frank Manuel's course was one of these places where converts to history were made. Mm -hmm. um, he mostly was interested in the history of ideas and intellectual history. And uh, we read original texts and talked about them. Mm -hmm. So, and and what what else did you get from Brandeis? I mean, was there something about the the atmosphere? I mean, we're we're sort of seeing where you come from very clearly, both in terms of your family background and and but but uh, did you get us uh, an even greater sense of activism there? Or yeah, it was. Um, I went to Brandeis. I started in the fall of 1958, mm -hmm. graduated in 1962. Um, 1960 were the sit-ins in Greensboro, North Carolina. 
And Michael Walzer, who is now my colleague at the Institute, but who had graduated several years before, was, I think, um, did a tour to, the, to Greensboro, North mm -hmm. Carolina, um, and to the South generally, um, and came back and reported to us about what he'd seen and urged us all to pick at Woolworths and mm -hmm. um, get engaged in, in all kinds of activities. And so that was um, another of those influences. But those were the years of real engagement in mm -hmm. any case. It was hard not to be engaged in student politics at Brandeis in those years. And, and it, so we're, we're talking about the, the civil rights movement and then, but you had already graduated before the, the Vietnam War actually heated yeah. up, yeah. The Vietnam War for me was my years at the University of Wisconsin as a graduate student. Right, and uh, uh, I, I'm, obviously the women's movement was very important for you in affecting your your consciousness. Talk, let's talk a little about that. I mean, was this were the inklings of this, you know, during your years at Brandeis, or was it really the '60s when you're at the University of Wisconsin? It wasn't even at the University of Wisconsin. I mean, I, I always say that there was an influence in my family because. My father, who was very secular as, as well as, as, as uh, politically engaged, um, would always tell us when we were quite young that the Bible was a book not to be trusted because mm. it was said that God had created woman out of man's rib and that there was an inherent inferiority assumed in mm. that that you had to be suspicious of. And we were certainly raised, my mother worked the whole time that I was growing up, we were certainly raised to believe that there was no difference in um, what men and women could do or should be expected to do. And many of my parents' friends were also teachers, women and men, and so there was not, um, there were uh, examples set for us as kids. Mm -hmm. uh, but no, when I was at Brandeis, it was, other kinds of politics, anti-nuclear politics, uh, civil rights stuff. At Wisconsin, it was uh, civil rights first, and 64 was mm -hmm. the Freedom Summer, and then um, Vietnam. Mm -hmm. um, and it really wasn't until I was teaching at, it was the first job I had teaching at the University of Illinois at Chicago, so that was 1970. And there were friends who were organizing courses in women's history because that was the really the beginning. Um, and I was part of a group of women faculty. We founded a daycare center. We founded a women's studies mm -hmm. uh, course, which then became a, a program. And it was there, and in those conversations and those discussions, that I began to be interested in the feminist movement and in women's history. And it was actually when I went to teach at Northwestern two years later that when the chairman of the department asked me if I would like to teach, I was the only woman in the department, asked me if I would like mm -hmm. to teach the course in women's history. I said yes, because I was interested. Mm -hmm. um, and the students were the ones. The students in those years would come mm -hmm. into the classes demanding um, inspiration, demanding stories about women in the past. And it was there. And a number of us, I think, went through that because um, there were groups, informal groups of women historians who would share course syllabi with each other, recommended reading, you know, what are you using? Because none of us had any idea of what, we, none of us were trained in, in women's history. And so we invented these courses and sent us, sent, sent each other, um, it wasn't even Xerox, it was mm -hmm. that purple stuff, whatever, <laughs> it was, you know, the... Carbon. No, it wasn't carbon, it was mimi, it was... A mimeograph, yeah. A four yeah, mimeograph, yeah, even. Yeah. There was some other cheaper version of mimeograph. Yeah. We would send this stuff in the mail, and it was like, I always said it was like Samizdat literature. You know, you'd send each other this stuff. And that was how I really became a women's historian, is I had to teach the course. I had to teach myself something of a history in order to be able to teach the course. Mm -hmm. And then I began to be really interested in some of the problems that... Um, were raised about women's history, particularly because I w was a labor historian to begin with. Yeah, let's talk about that, and then okay, we'll get back, back to the women's. Yeah. So at, at Wisconsin, your focus was on labor history. Well, and I came into Wisconsin knowing, well, I came into Wisconsin, and Wisconsin in those years was teeming with graduate students. It was 1960, fall of 1962, and um, the chairman of the department, who was named Merrill Jensen, was known for preferring not to have women in graduate seminars, thinking that it would destroy the camaraderie of 
Gee, the workers. men in the seminar. <laughs> and when you came to graduate school at Wisconsin, you met with the chair and you were then assigned a seminar for life. Mm -hmm. And um, I came in and he said to me, um, what language do you have? What, do you, what history do you want to do? I mean, these days, I don't know if you know this, but these days, you get interviewed by students wanting to come to graduate school. Mm -hmm. They want to know, they call you up, they come and interview you, they yeah. want to know what you require, what mm -hmm. your qualifications are, and so on and so forth. Then you went. Um, I think I was notified that I was accepted with a postcard with my acceptance number on it in the mail. Um, and you came in, and the chair of the department assigned you at Wisconsin to a seminar. And so he said, what language do you have? And I said, French, because I had that from high, junior high, actually. And he said, OK, French history seminar. And that's how I became a French historian. I, I see. <laughs> it really is. I see. And, and were you looking at, at labor history? In well, I was in the seminar first of somebody who retired very quickly, and mm -hmm. then in the seminar of somebody named Harvey Goldberg, who was a a labor historian, a, social, a historian of socialism, and I was in his seminar. Uh, but in his seminar, you had to write a biography of a famous socialist, which mm. I quickly was bored with and didn't want to do. He was on leave, and um, a couple of professors formed a social history seminar. It was the beginning of the movement for social history mm -hmm. in the field of history. Um, and we read E.P. Thompson's Making of the English Working Class and a number of other books, which inspired not only me, but a whole generation of people to become social historians. Mm -hmm. And I was particularly interested in labor history. And so I did my dissertation on glass workers in the mm -hmm. south of France, in a town in the south of France. Uh, now, to talk again about uh, the development of the feminist movement, it, it, it sounds like you're saying that, that really this, uh, because I want to explore the way ideas change in, in the face of both social and, and political movements. Mm -hmm. So what, what you're, you're really, I think you just said was that as you s saw the need for this new curriculum, and you participated in the making of it, that that the the pressures came from the bottom up. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And and so it was just part of the, the those times when authority across the board was was being questioned. The war in Vietnam and, and That's on right. and on. And those of us who were sort of, I think some of us were predisposed by our own backgrounds and family experiences to be to be interested in politics and to participate in politics. I think that um, provided the opportunity to, in fact, explore these questions further and to bring together. When I was an undergraduate at Brandeis, I did my politics and I did my history, even though there were people who were interested in both. But I never thought of them as being part of the same project. Doing women's history is when I began to realize that there could be a relationship between the academic work I did mm -hmm. and what I thought of was not its short-term I mean, I wasn't doing policy work, but in terms of changing ideas, in terms of challenging prevailing ways of thinking about things, mm -hmm. that I could do that as a scholar and think of it as having some inherent political effect as well. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I want to ask you what it is you think it takes to be a historian. What, what are the skills involved? Because you're, you're really, what you've just described is you're navigating two worlds. Mm -hmm. And I, I have no doubt that in the beginning, uh, doing serious feminist studies was considered Irresponsible, That's in right. quotes. Yeah. So, so, so let let's stop a minute. And so, what, what, what? Uh, when one looks at your work, you get the sense that a lot is going on. I mean, it's it's not just history; it's social theory. And so, on. talk a little about that. What, what do students need to do the kind of work you were doing? I think students need some kind of theoretical uh, background. I think I got a theoretical background at Brandeis, not mm -hmm. only Marcuse, but there were a whole bunch of social theorists, not all of them Marxists like mm -hmm. Marcuse. Coser. <coughs> Coser. Um, oh, there were, there were more. Um, yeah, yeah. Irving Howe was still there. Yeah, yeah. Um, but in any case, that there were, there were social theorists who were also Weberians, who were Durkheimians, mm -hmm. who were Marxists. And I think an exposure to the kind of analytic thinking that theory allows you to do is really important. Otherwise, what you do as a historian is just describe things that happened. And you're not very self-conscious about what it is that's going on 
below the surface or uh, what it is that's forming the uh, movements or political uh, events that that you're wanting to study. So mm -hmm. one thing I think is is some kind of theoretical grounding. And for me, this is the jumps ahead in the story, but for me, it was particularly post-structuralism and someone like reading Michel Foucault who changed the theoretical orientation I started with and allowed me to think differently about um, doing history and particularly about actually about doing women's history and, and gender history at a point where I just couldn't figure my way out of women as a kind of supplement to the main story. And, and what was, what, go into the particulars there, in what way did he affect you? Well, it could be a long academic okay. lecture. Right. We don't right. want that. Right. So, so briefly. <laughs> One of the things that, that Foucault writes about or, or calls your attention to is the fact that the questions you have in the present are not innocent or objective questions. They're questions that are related to the time you live in, mm. to the political justifications or challenges to the politics of the time you live in. So, for example, to do women's history would mean not just to say, what did women do in the past, but to say, what is it, what, what is it now that lets us think about gender the relations between men and women in the ways we do as a natural category. Did people always think that the differences were entirely natural? What's the difference between thinking about gender as God's product or nature's product? Is there any difference? Mm -hmm. What's the difference if you say there have always been changes in the categories even of men and women over time and we need to know what those are? Because not only will it help us understand the past, but it'll make us realize mm -hmm. that things can be changed in the in the present, that things aren't always, don't always have to be the way they always seem to have been. It sounds like it, it takes courage to move in this realm on the one hand, uh, but then it, it can be a real source of creativity. Well, it is. I mean, I think, I think there was some dimension of me that was always uh, a little bit rebellious. <laughs> <laughs> some people would say more. So. But um, so that I was looking to challenge things in some way or, or another. Um, I was never quite satisfied with the way I learned the things I, I learned. And part of that was, unlike these days, it seems to me that the 1950s and 60s, for all that we say the 50s was an era of conformity. One of the things at Brandeis that you learned was that the best essay exams you could write were ones that challenged the premises of the question. Mm -hmm. If you got an essay exam and said, you know, the Civil War was caused by slavery, mm -hmm. if you just said yes and wrote the answer, that was not good enough. Mm -hmm. If you said um, the premise that the Civil War was caused by slavery ignores questions of economics, mm -hmm. politics, the mm -hmm. In interests of the economic interests of the states and so on mm -hmm. and so forth, you got you could get an A. Mm -hmm. And so I think that the teaching that we got, and I don't I'm not sure how conscious everybody was about this teaching, but was to think critically and always to call into question the presuppositions of any thing that you were being offered. So I learned that and I think I learned that well in in, in college, and again, it was true in graduate school as well. So when I read Foucault, it was like another version mm. of the critical challenge. It was, okay, he's saying that you don't have to think of history as a continuous linear development. You can ask where the breaks are and why they happen. And even if the words used are the same, women, man, reason, mm -hmm. passion, mm -hmm. They mean different things at different times. What is it that brings those different meanings into effect? Um, and then you get a whole different take, a much more exciting, for me, a much more mm -hmm. exciting take on um, history mm -hmm. and on what you can do then with knowledge of the past. Now, now you took this to another step and, and you wrote a, uh, a, a, a classic article uh, uh, in, in, in called Gender, a Useful Category of Historical Analysis, which appeared in the American Historical Review. Tell us about that, and how, how was that the next step, and, and how you think it affected uh, other scholars who, who were interested in this subject? Well, I wrote that in, in 1985, it was published in 86, but in 85, and I had just gone to teach at Brown University. 
And Brown University then and now is a quirky, uh, the best parts of Brown University are its refusal to be like everybody else. Uh, students, faculty, and in fact, the more Brown becomes like everybody else, the sadder mm -hmm. I become about its, its. <laughs> but it's the sort of place where, uh, this is just a, a little uh, di digression, but a couple of weeks ago I read an article by somebody um, and I thought, this is really interesting, really critical, really good. And I looked at him, I Googled him, and sure enough, he had been a Brown undergraduate. Mm -hmm. And I thought, it's like the trademark or something mm -hmm. that gets stamped on a certain kind of student. In any case, I had gone to Brown. I had been at the University of North Carolina. I had gone to Brown and um, went as a professor of history and women's studies. And the people in women's studies were, many of them in literature, uh, very much influenced by psychoanalysis and post-structuralism, things I had had no exposure to at all. And I began to read with them. And um, there was a small reading group we had, and, and so I read Foucault, Derrida, the, you know, lots of things I had never read before. And um, everyone was talking about, or lots of people were talking about gender. Uh, a wonderful phenomenon among historians, the Berkshire Conference on Women's History, the Berkshire Conference of Women Historians, had organized, starting in the 70s, conferences where people came and presented papers. And early versions of a book I did in Women's History with Louise Tilley of Women, Work, and Family were presented at those Berkshire conferences. So there was tremendous amount of talk and excitement and discussion in the air. I came to Brown trying to figure out how to think about gender, women and men, in history in ways that I couldn't think my way through. I mean, I was, I, the, the, the Marxist analyses didn't work for me, other kinds of analyses didn't work for me or didn't completely work. And then I came up upon this post-structuralist stuff, particularly Foucault. And I thought, well, this could mm. do it. And I had to, I was invited to give a paper at the AH American Historical Association meetings on a panel on gender. And I thought, OK. And so in the kind of heat of discovery, of excitement, of wanting to touch every base, I wrote this paper. I think of, as I think about or remember writing it, it was a kind of intellectual frenzy of a sort of wonderful kind. I wasn't angry at anybody. Because mm -hmm. when you write things in anger, it, it's, it's not as mm -hmm. pleasurable. This was just like, I could go anywhere with this. I would see what I could do with it. Mm -hmm. And so I did, and it did become um, a kind of classic article. Mm -hmm. In the most recent issue of the American Historical Review, there was a forum 20 plus years later on the writing of that article, which people talked about its impact and its influence. And the most amazing thing to me was the discovery that of all the articles published in the AHR since it's been available online or since J whatever it is, since the 1990s. It is the most frequently consulted and cited of hmm. any. Hmm. And I was really taken aback. I mean, I did not think of it as having that broad a, um, a field of, of influence. And, and what, what was the impact, do you think, in, in that it opened the eyes of a whole new generation no, of scholars? No, or? I think their eyes were already open. I think it focused yeah, the questions. Um, in, in my reply to that forum, I say, you know, I didn't invent this. I was there participating in it. Mm -hmm. And what I did was articulate a set of questions that we were all grappling with. And I just had the luck or I, you know, I articulated it in a way that um, took and that people then used and could refer to. But I think of it as a kind of culmination rather than a beginning of a, a particular set of movements in the field of women's history. So uh, it's interesting because I think that background really helps us understand uh, this book, uh, your new book, which is called The Politics of, of the Veil. And so, so what I think the premise you're starting with and where we've come to is, is really that history has an important role to play mm -hmm. uh, in 
contemporary political discourse, uh, but but it's a particular kind of history that has evolved uh, in in the last 20 years. Right. T talk a little about that before we talk about the okay. particulars of this case. Yeah, I think I would call it critical history. Mm -hmm. It's and Foucault actually calls it the history of the present, which means that you take up contemporary issues but not political issues in the sort of small, not, not the stimulus package, mm -hmm. but the language used to think the problems of mm -hmm. the moment. Um, you know, the market might mm -hmm. be one of them right mm -hmm. now, um, and whether or not there's such a thing as a free mm -hmm. market. But what's the sort of history of the idea of the market? Are mm -hmm. we in a period in which um, Adam Smith's ideas are simply being reapplied, or is something entirely different going on, which is is using those ideas, but for a very different set of mm -hmm. issues. So it's it's a history that's sensitive to the conceptual um, categories with which people think, that then critically looks at them and tries to disturb the power that they have. Um, in, in actually in this book, if we want to mm -hmm. take an example from the Vale book, it's the French idea of universalism mm -hmm. that, that I was interested in and that first got me interested in the question of the Vale. In France, the notion that um, everybody's individuals, all individuals are equal, uh, that to recognize difference is to uh, acknowledge uh, um, cracks in the, mm -hmm. uh, in the building of, of a unified nation and of a, uni a universal set of principles that are equally applied to everybody. Um, I thought there was something wrong with that notion mm -hmm. when you looked at any number of issues in French society, but the, one of the moment was the treatment of um, Muslim immigrants, some of whom are not immigrants at all, who've been there for generations, but the treatment of Muslims and particularly girls in headscarves in public schools. Mm -hmm. So instead of writing a book in which I said, okay, here's the story, um, mm -hmm. I said, what is it that allows the French to mm -hmm. think about Muslims as and, and the wearing of a headscarf as an unacceptable form of behavior? And why headscarves? Why women? Mm -hmm. Why not go after um, imams? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, why not, not that they don't discriminate against uh, North Africans who are Muslims, North Africans and Africans who are Muslims, but it's what is it that f allowed this to become the symbol of what was wrong with Muslims in French society? So, so in picking up this problem, and, and I guess very briefly, uh, I'm going to walk you through this, but the, the, the issue here was young women uh, wearing uh, scarfs, veil. Not veiled, uh, uh, just, just, uh, just, just the job, the yeah, yeah, just the scarf to school uh, and creating such a stir in France that it led to uh, a banning of, of uh, that practice. Now, uh, 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 interestingly enough, you, you've actually started your analysis on the way you think and, and what you're, so as a historian doing critical history, uh, uh, you, you, you say, well, uh, and, and following Foucault, what are the, what, what, let's go back and look at the founding principle right. here. So, so that, that is one thing, and you just helped us understand that. So, so what does it mean, uh, uh, and uh, uh, what, what, what has the French Revolution meant in the way uh, France has, has seen itself? Now, the other, the other thing that's going on here very clearly, because you have a chapter on, on women, you have a chapter on individualism, on secularism, is is it's it, 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 you you you're delving into history, but you're looking at another a number of issues that somehow have flowed through time, mm -hmm. been resolved in a certain way under this umbrella of theory, and and you have to look at those other issues before you can confront them. Is that a fair assessment of what you're doing here? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I wouldn't say that, that they continue through time in the same way. No, right, yeah. But that there are a set of concepts that certainly were at play in this um, mm -hmm. controversy about headscarves. I just have to say that it wasn't that these girls caused problems in school with their headscarves. Mm -hmm. There were probably at most a couple of thousand girls out of a population of Muslims of maybe six million. Mm -hmm. um, so we're not talking about uh, a huge threat suddenly inundating the classrooms. We're talking about a heightened consciousness of 
the presence of Muslims, particularly after September 11th. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's no... There, in, in 1989, at the bicentennial of the French Revolution, was the first um, explosion of this. Uh, and a, teach, a principal in a junior high decided that he wasn't going to tolerate girls in headscarves anymore. That they had been coming to school with mm -hmm. headscarves. Um, boys were coming to school, Jewish boys, with yarmulkes. Um, Sikhs were coming with their turbans. Nobody was bothered. Mm -hmm. about, if they were bothered about this, it was not an issue. Mm -hmm. In 1989, this guy says, I'm not taking, you're not going to be in school anymore. You, we're not having, a, the Muslim jihad is not going to be allowed into French mm -hmm. classrooms. Um, it t quiets down, there are negotiations and all things happen. 1994, it erupts again, 2003 again. And in the book, each time I show what's happening politically, mm -hmm. particularly with the far right in France, who's raising the immigration issue and pushing because the of center. the large population of, of immigrants, well, large in, in increasingly in, large, increasingly large, yeah, and different in a way that earlier populations have not been. France has long been a country of immigration, but the requirement was that you assimilated to mm -hmm. the the country. So if you came from Portugal or Italy or Spain or you learned the language, you behaved like everybody else, you looked like everybody else. There's two problems with them with Muslims. One is they're darker, or they're three maybe. One is that they're darker. Two is that they're, f they're coming from former colonies. Mm -hmm. So that their relationship socially to the, dom the, the, the metropole, to the dominant population in France, is as people who have been defined in a certain way, as inferior for mm -hmm. years and years. 100, 1830 is when the French conquer Algeria for the first time. So you have a long history which associates these people with inferiority. Mm -hmm. um, and the third thing is that they are insisting on practicing their religion in a public way, whereas part of the assimilation process in France is that religion is a private matter. And if mm -hmm. you do it privately at home, there's no problem. It's fine. But if you're if you demonstrate your religiosity by wearing a headscarf, by praying five times a day, by um, in school, refusing to eat certain foods that are f offered in the cafeteria, mm -hmm. then you're um, breaking the rules and trying to introduce what ought to be private into the sphere of the public. So w what you're saying uh, is that there was something about this issue that attracted you because it seemed to be pushing so many buttons and if you didn't go back and unravel what you know the source of these buttons then it was kind of weird that yeah. suddenly they were focusing on young girls as opposed to the young Jewish lad in the yarmulke or the right. or the or the, or the yeah. sick it just seemed to me to be out of proportion the, the and it was hysteria the hysteria mm -hmm. about these headscarves the speeches people were making the articles you would read in the newspapers the ultimate destruction of everything that was predicted if girls were allowed to keep coming to school in headscarves, was so out of proportion mm -hmm. to the phenomenon itself, <clears throat> which was a couple of thousand girls at most in a few suburban areas outside of the major cities, mm -hmm. of, and particularly outside of Paris, it raised its own question, like, why is this happening? Mm -hmm. What is it about the society that is causing this to become the kind of focus of political debate? And, and there, there are two intriguing elements to this story before we get back to the big picture. One is, I, I believe you said that the, the school teacher or the principal who was involved over time went into politics, basically. Did well, he, there were two things. He, he was black. Yeah. He was from the Antilles. Yeah. But thought of himself as French. The Antilles are one of the overseas departments of France. Yeah. And two, he was preparing a career in politics yeah. um, and the, on the sort of in the, in the Gaullist side, which is this right center of political uh, and, and and to do that you, you essentially had to uh, be seem to be responsive to the, the these right wing concerns to almost the anti -immigrant. Fashion, to the anti immigrant now and then the the girls involved uh, were were as I recall from the book they, they were the children of of Jews and had converted uh, no no just one no not no, in that one no, no that the first in 1989 these were yeah. there were two girls from Morocco I think and one from Tunisia oh, okay but later what was, a, there was a, a, a rebellious young woman in 2003 yeah 
at the time, just before the law, or I think it's 2003, just before the law passes, or maybe when the law passed, but right in that, no, it's before the law, right in that moment, there were these two girls who were, but they weren't, there were many, many more girls who were Muslims and not converts at all. Mm -hmm. These girls were uh, daughters of a, a Berber mother and a Jewish father, so mm -hmm. they were legally, at least according to one set of principles, they were um, more, they were more Muslim or, the mother was a Christian though, she was a Berber Christian. Mm -hmm. So they were, they were not technically Jewish, although their last name, Levy, was, and so that immediately, when I saw that, I thought, Levy, what, what kind <laughs> yeah, of a name is Levy, right? right? Having gone to That's Brandeis right. University, <laughs> yeah. I knew. But in any case, the, the, these girls had converted, uh, much to the distress of their parents, who were mm -hmm. uh, leftists, both of them, um, and uh, they knew the five pillars of Islam, and they prayed, and they, you know, wanted to do everything. And but it clearly was rebellion that was mm -hmm. that was going on. And it, it was one of the moments I think that I thought, and I wasn't the only one who th said this. There were a number of French sociologists mm -hmm. who said this. You know, if this had been the 1970s, these girls would have been Maoists. Yeah. And now we're in the in the in the 2000, the 21st century, mm -hmm. and what is available as a kind of radical departure from materialism, Western imperialism, uh, global economic uh, transformations? It is for some of them. Um, Islam, and for for good reason, for serious mm -hmm. reasons, not frivolous ones. Um, but it is a language of protest as, as much as it is, or in, in the same way that it is also a language of religion. I mean, I don't want to say that it's not about religion, yeah. but it is the available language of um, a kind of radical stand that you can take. And, and it's about, as, as Olivier Waugh and others have pointed out, it, it's really about a, a, a youthful response to the issues raised by globalization and, and kind of the, the statement of an identity mm -hmm. that's eclectic and uh, makes the young person part of a larger community. Yeah, absolutely, and, and of an international one, not mm -hmm. just a, a national one. Even if the kids themselves are not political in, in the scary ways that uh, those who want to outlaw the, the, uh, the headscarf or ban immigration from these countries altogether, say it is. I mean, I don't think it's about terrorism. It's about a kind of identification mm -hmm. that um, is a way of thinking yourself out of a situation of great discrimination in which a lot of these kids live in um, France or, for that matter, if they're Turks in Germany or in the Netherlands or, or anywhere else. You're talking about minority, often very poor populations, mm -hmm. unlike Amer in the United States where so much of the Muslim immigration is um, middle class and professional. In these countries, you're talking about a kind of, of lower class of, of people who are, dis on top of being economically disadvantaged, discriminated against on the basis of what I would call race um, mm -hmm. in the end. But uh, in a way, you're, you're bringing light to, uh, to a, uh, a public perception of what's going on, and and I want you to characterize that perception because you're you're saying that this notion uh, that 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 or this perspective that drives the the powers that be mm -hmm. is a is a very is is lack subtlety. It's it's really a blind way of approaching uh, Muslim communities both within and without, and it seems to have similarities not to the way we treat Muslims in the United States, but the way our foreign policy. Yes. You know, treat. Talk a little them. about that because there is a there is a uh, a sense that well we're modern they're fundamentalists uh, uh, th this Islam comes in one package you can't disaggregate it and so on talk, talk a little well, about well yeah I mean that was one of the things in fact that struck me in in this campaign but in all of these campaigns the the other night I gave a lecture um, in in to a group of to a World Affairs Council actually in in California. Mm. And um, the message I was trying to deliver was, in fact, that, well, one of them was that you can't think of the West and Islam, mm -hmm. or in this case of the, the book I was writing, France and Islam. Those categories, when you start thinking that way, hide the enormous diversities of 
um, social, religious, practical, name it, on both sides. I mean, one of the ways in which I think that um, the issue of Islam and the West has been used uh, politically recently is to cover over in the West all of the problems of gender equality or of gender inequality that are now being attributed to Islam. So if we can say, well, one of our objections to them is that women are unequal and wearing a headscarf is a sign of their inequality. Even if the women will say to you, no, I'm wearing this headscarf because it's my way of deferring to God. Just like a Jewish man will wear a yarmulke and say, he's deferring to God, I'm wearing this to defer. It has nothing to do with my father, it has nothing to do with my brothers, anybody. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that all of them are do it for these reasons, but mm -hmm. but instead of being able to to sort of see that, the headscarf is the sign of inequality. We who don't wear a headscarf are living in an egalitarian society, and that makes it possible then to overlook all of the inequalities that persist in Western societies. Mm -hmm. If you look at the numbers of women in the elected parliaments of, of, of the West, you know, it's 15, 16, maybe 18 percent, that's it. How do you explain, um, if women are totally equal, how do you explain unequal access or unequal wages or all the sorts of things that, in fact, feminists have typically been concerned about and, and politically active about. But once you introduce this Islam, us versus them, then all of those issues of inequality mm -hmm. pale, and as feminists we become interested in, take, in liberating them mm -hmm. from their headscarves, and we forget about the kinds of problems that, that we face so, here. So this is about power and the way words and symbols become uh, an instrument of powerful mm -hmm. to to uh, uh, essentially uh, deal with a situation by in a way not dealing with yeah. it. I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's it is exactly what you said. It's yeah. the way in which language structures relations of power, so you don't even get to see them mm -hmm. in the way in which they're actually operating. Um, you know, at the moment of of the the uh, uh, war in the beginning of the war in Afghanistan. Laura Bush was g yeah. talking everywhere about how we were freeing mm -hmm. these women from uh, the oppression that they had suffered, even as her president's administration was trying to take away the right to abortion, uh, mm -hmm. uh, was being supported by Christian fundamentalists who believed that women's role was to stay at home and, and have children and take care of their children. And there was no re realization on the part of many people who bought that line Mm -hmm. that these were people who at home were interested in oppressing women mm -hmm. <laughs> in certain ways while liberating them um, mm -hmm. in, in Afghanistan. And, and in the French case, you, you're, you, you're, your background as a, a, as a, uh, a scholar and a theoretician of, of women's issues sort of enables you to see some important things about the French ambivalence about sexuality having nothing to do with these young girls who are Muslim, but really that that there if we go back to political theory and the to, to, uh, to, to French uh, theory that says uh, we're all equal by not being different, then it, it doesn't address the problem of sexuality, right. where, where there are differences of that sexual, are really, right. yeah. Yeah, of sexual difference, where, yeah. Yeah, where there, well, where, where di the difference is thought to be natural and therefore inescapable. Mm -hmm. um, but I, in some ways I think of that as, as uh, the hardest part of the book and, the, mm -hmm. and, the, and also the one where I, I figured something out that hadn't been quite talked about in, mm -hmm. in, in the same way before, but it, you, you have it exactly right. Yeah. That is that uh, if in order to be equal you have to be the same, mm -hmm. and you get to be the same by being abstracted from your social characteristics, religion, ethnicity, mm -hmm. uh, class, occupation, whatever it is, um, then that's fine as a way of thinking about uh, formal political rights. We're all individuals, we're all equal. But if at the same time there's one set of characteristics that cannot be abstracted, which is sex, and those are thought to be naturally different and therefore inescapable, then French political theory always has a difficult time mm -hmm. with equality on the one hand and sexual difference on the other hand. And so you have a history in which liberty, equality, and fraternity are declared in the French Revolution in 1789. 
and it takes till 1944 for women to get the vote. <laughs> that was a shocker when I read that, yeah. And then it takes till 2000 for a law to pass that says women have to have equal access to elective office in France for the years from 44, when women first get the vote, until 2000, there's about 5%. Mm -hmm. uh, women are about 5% of the National Assembly and mm -hmm. less than that of the Senate in France. So, um, you know, the question then is what, what do you mean by equality? Mm -hmm. Yes, we have the right to vote, but what, what does it mean to... Um, and so what I argue is that uh, where you have this tension between natural difference or naturalized, so-called natural difference on the one hand, and um, abstract individualism, which is the basis for equality. On the other, you have a tremendous tension, which the French address, I think, by um, talking about sexiness and sexual seduction mm. and flirtatiousness between men and women as a national character trait. And there were, in fact, a series of books written in the, mm -hmm. around the time of the, of the bicentennial which talked about this. There was one by a historian called Mona Ozouf, Ozouf which was called uh, Les mots des femmes, words of women, essay sur la singularité française, an essay on French singularity. And what was French singularity? But this mm. aristocratic remnant of flirtatiousness and sexual mm -hmm. play and the public display of, of w women, men, women, and so on. And what I argue in there is that, that uh, Muslims are doing exactly the opposite. That is, Muslims are saying by the modest clothing that is worn, um, there's no sexual play mm -hmm. between men and women in public and in political realms causes trouble. And to avoid that trouble, we are going to separate the sexes. Mm -hmm. We are going to wear clothing which um, underestimates and um, doesn't emphasize sexuality and sexual attractiveness. And there's a clash there between two styles of thinking about how to represent the relations between the sexes that I think fed into mm -hmm. the French anxiety about um, Islam, but also the reason, what, it was one of the reasons that the headscarf and women and women's dress became a hot political issue. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, when, when you put all this together, uh, you're, you're saying at the end of the book that uh, what we get is a series of uh, uh, Policy responses that don't really address the issue, the, the the issues. They don't. It doesn't tell us what's really at work here, and it, it doesn't look at you know the the broader problems. Now, ironically, you you identify the the one of the greatest channel, uh, challenges of a world of nationalization and globalization is negotiating difference, mm -hmm. and and uh, so in the end, following this this logic that occurs within the. French system, and I'm sure there are counterparts, you know, on other issues in the United States. What you you wind up doing is uh, coming up with a, a a way of responding that doesn't address the central problem, right. which is people have differences, people belong to groups, and we have to find a, a, a way in a democracy of their working together, both within a country and globally. And working together without the difference being um, thought of as invidious, you know, mm -hmm. without the difference being hierarchy, being turned into a hierarchy, uh, without the difference being a difference of power, but just acknowledging um, that difference is, in fact, the human condition. Mm -hmm. I, I cite a French philosopher at the end of the book named uh, Jean-Luc Nancy, who says, in, instead of thinking about having a common being, that is, all of us being somehow the same, we need to think of having being in common. And being in common understands being as a state of difference. Individuals are different from one another. Groups are different from one another. Uh, difference is the human condition. And if you could think in those terms, it's utopian, I know, mm -hmm. but if you could think in those terms, then you would be in a situation in which difference couldn't be used 
to structure relations of power. Other things probably would be, mm -hmm. but these kinds of differences wouldn't. Mm -hmm. Now, now you 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 have taken us on a journey in this book where uh, you you really unearth the uh, where this issue came from and and mm -hmm. you you put it in a context uh, and so so the question becomes how does this analysis come to matter in other words does it does it feed back in the in the discourse I mean when we're talking about the women's movement it's very clear how it it did some change but not as much change as was really necessary do, do you see this kind of uh, historical work applied to policy debates uh, affecting the discourse, you know, in, in real time? Well, probably yes and no. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, I think it would be foolish to think that any single book um, or any intervention in a set of conversations uh, could, cha could work change. Maybe there are, maybe we could think of books that blew up a, a way of thinking about things. But I, you know, I think you only actually do that in retrospect. I mean, I think you could say Simone de Beauvoir's The Second Sex became a kind of crucial text looking back on it 20 or 30 years later when a women's movement came into existence and cited it. Mm -hmm. So I think there, there, there's the, the, the theoretical thinking and critical thinking does not have an immediate policy impact. Mm -hmm. um, but what you hope to do with, or what I hope to do with this kind of work is to get enough people thinking differently about the questions to kind of shake the uh, firmness of the ground on which some of these opinions um, stand. Mm -hmm. So that, for example, uh, the other day when I was talking to this group of, at the World Affairs Council, and people said to me, yes, but you know, we know that in Muslims, this and this, in, in Muslim societies, this is the view of women. Mm -hmm. And I could say in that situation, well, that's not really true. Um, it's much more complicated than that. And here are the reasons, and here are the da da da. And make the, take an example that, from something that was familiar to them and say, but you know, here, here are girls saying they made a choice to be modest before God, let's say, or to. Uh, respect mm -hmm. God. I think you you introduce doubt about the certainty of the the uh, predominant ideas or the ones that are sort of held. And if you can do that, mm -hmm. you begin to make a difference in the general way people think, and then maybe ultimately in the policy things. I mean, something like gay marriage is an example. Mm -hmm. um, a couple of, you know, 20 years ago, or, or at the time of, of the making of the film uh, Milk, to, to, mm -hmm. to come up to, you know, recent Hollywood stuff, uh, that, th the idea that, that, merit, that, that the star of the movie, a straight actor, would get up and accept the Academy Award by saying that Proposition 8 shouldn't have been passed, yeah. and that we'll come to a day when, in fact, mm -hmm. Harvey Milk's dream would be realized even beyond his wildest doubts would have been unthinkable 30 mm -hmm. years ago. So what's happened over the course of, of those years that has, in the American public at large, created a much greater um, acceptance of the notion that there are people who are gay and that that's fine, mm -hmm. and that maybe even there are gay people who can marry? I mean, what is it that you could ac account for what does seem to me a fundamental change, despite the persistence of right-wing opposition, mm -hmm. despite the Pope's <laughs> mm -hmm. um, resistance to or condemnation of, of all of these kinds of things. The fact is, if you look at these public opinion polls, most people either don't care or are uh, positively inclined to mm -hmm. these kinds of, of transformations. So how do you account for it? Well, there have been social movements, there have been individual experiences, there have been books that have been written, there have been movies. You know, there's a whole sure. set of voices that have come into a conversation of which historians, philosophers, theorists are one small part. And I think that's the way hmm. uh, social change happens. Uh, and it's, it's as a participant in an ongoing critical conversation that some people will latch on to and, and 
um, disseminate in some ways mm -hmm. that I think that I imagine my own the work that my own um, writing does. It, one final question, and, and let me see if I can formulate a question because this it strikes me that what we're talking about is the relationship of power to ideas, and, and ideas emerge from a changing consciousness, and that we, we seem to go through a period when the politics uh, seems to be one in which those with the fewest ideas uh, uh, seem to maximize power by sort of closing off our insight into the complexity of the issue, but that over time, you know, ideas can make a difference, as, as you just suggested. Yeah, and it depends on the, the circumstances. I mean, you know, I think if we were to do this history I was just talking about, there would be moments at which for what we some people might say were economic reasons or some for various kinds of social reasons, the structure of families, the prevalence of divorce, the numbers of broken and recombined, you know, on it, we could, we could do reproductive technology. I mean, there would be lots of smaller histories that we would need to get at to um, untangle this, uh, these sets of historical developments. So I think the ideas are tremendously important and the ideas give voice or conceptualization to the processes that are, that are going on, but it's the kind of contingent mixtures of these things that ultimately make the difference and create the change. Well, Professor Scott, uh, I want to thank you for taking the time to come to the campus and to be on our program. Let me show your book again, The Politics of the Veil. I always like to say that there's a limit to how much justice you can do to a book like this in such a short time, but, but hopefully our audience will go out and buy it. And I want to thank you uh, very much for joining us today. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for joining us for this conversation with history.